it looks like this, yeah. It's yeah, always a solid <laughs> answer. Yeah. Yep. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start muting everybody so that we can get started. Thank you so much to everybody for joining. I'm gonna do kind of the technical back of the house stuff here. Chuck, if you wanna give us a nice intro, that would be awesome. I will do my best at a nice intro. Uh, thank you everybody again for, yeah, for joining us. Um, we're really excited uh, today because it's uh, I, I know a subject certainly that's a favorite of probably a lot of us here on on the uh, the Zoom conference. But uh, so today's Kindred Vines Masterclass, of course, is a, a spotlight on champagne uh, with a, a special uh, special guest appearance by uh, Matthew Leno, who is the export manager for uh, Joseph Perrier. So Joseph Perrier uh, is a producer that was recently added within the last year to the Kindred Vines portfolio. Uh, we had a bit of, uh, uh, of uh, a reworking of our champagne uh, portfolio because we saw, you know, we saw a need from the market, we saw an opportunity, and there's, um, you know, I, I'm sure as Matthew will talk about, such a great, uh, you know, uh, array of, of great producers from the region of Champagne. Um, it is a, a, a huge appellation and there is a lot to learn a lot to know about it and you know hopefully within this presentation we can help uh maybe uh destigmatize or uh de-dramatize as uh matthew uh to steal a term uh you know that we were just talking about um but in the most positive way possible basically just saying it can be an intimidating subject certainly um but we want to be here uh, along with you to, to help learn about it uh you know grow more uh you know, a lot more information about the region and, uh, you know, and, and continue on down the road of, you know, hopefully selling, uh, you know, selling and enjoying a lot more champagne. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a complex area and I know Matthew will help uh, demystify that a little bit. And the, the structure uh, is certainly one of the most unique and interesting uh, for all the Appalachians uh, in, in any country that we work with. So it's really just a, a fascinating area uh, with fantastic wines, um, they're not only, of course, for celebrations, but, you know, as a lot of us are nearing uh, the end of our, our quarantines and shutdowns here, you know, we certainly could use any excuse to celebrate right now. So I think this is, this is perfect timing um, as we we're just discussing some of the markets in northern Michigan are opening back up and, you know, going into, you know, nicer weather. Um, and certainly a time of celebration. This is this is perfect timing here. So um, we'll bring in Matthew here right now to, to help talk to us a little bit about Champagne as a region, but most importantly, uh, the historic uh, producer of uh, Joseph Perrier, which he is the export manager for. So please, Matthew uh, Leno, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure, you know. Um, I'm very thrilled to be with you tonight. Uh, uh, I'm always prefer to actually take a flight and board in a flight to come and meet you in person. Uh, but uh, as you know, we, we absolutely can't, cannot do that anymore until further notice. So um, it was very important for me to continue to actually talk about Joseph Perry, um, to talk about Champagne, first of all, because this is always what I'm talking about when we discuss about Champagne. And of course, we are all uh, in Champagne talking about the distinctiveness of our houses, our our, you know, vineyards of what we do. Uh, but we are first um, talking about Champagne because we are a strong fan of the region of the wine that is produced over there. And that's something which is very, very important to, to, to understand. Um, so that's why I think to start the presentation, I think we need to uh, actually to go a little bit uh, first on what is Champagne and an overview of the region and of the area. Um, I will not read the presentation and I'm sure you can actually have access to that presentation uh, after uh, this uh, Zoom call. Um, it's just a quick reminder of you know, the different principles that we need to follow, um, especially in the framework and uh, the regulation that we need to follow, which is very important and which makes Champagne so distinctive compared to any other sparkling wine that you can find in the world. Um, so, of course, produced by natural yeast fermentation in the bottle. I think that everyone knows that, of course. Um, I've written three authorized grapes, which is not totally true because we have uh, six authorized grapes. But, of course, the three that I mentioned are the three that are the most 
use, mostly used um, in the blending champagne, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Each of them um, mostly planted in one part of the region. Um, so we talk about the Côte des Blancs for the Chardonnay, the Pinot Noir on the Montagne de Reims, and the Pinot Meunier alongside the Marne Valley, the Marne River. Uh, so it's a very specific champagne winemaking, of course, storage premises. Um, a minimum 15 months of storage, so this is a rule, uh, but of course um, there is a rule and there is what the houses are doing. Um, um, qualitative houses usually tend to age the wine for a minimum of, you know, three years to four years. And Joseph Perrier is, of course, one of them. So the Britain vintage that we offer to the market actually stayed up to four years into our cellars before this is going to be released on the market. But the rules written by the appellation is 15 months storage for the non-vintage and 36 months for the vintage wine. So that's giving an idea between uh, of, of a qualitative uh, house. And of course, this meta champenoise, which is famous uh, for because it was definitely uh, give us uh, novelty letters uh, to champagne. Um, of course, feel free not to interrupt all the time you need. Or on the chat, I think he said, um, 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 so we can definitely answer the question if it's working. Yes, yes. So just a quick map. Uh, I think I like this map because this is actually summarizing very well. Um, champagne is all. So in blue, you're going to see the Côte des Blancs, which is uh, the area in Champagne where you're going to find uh, mostly the Chardonnay grapes in addition. In orange, it's going to be the Marne Valley, the Marne River. So this is where it's going to be mostly planted of Pinot Meunier. And in purple, red, pink, I'm not sure about the color, but this is going to be the Montagne de Reims where you're going to find the Pinot Noir. Uh, of course, this is not restrictive, which means you can definitely can find uh, some Pinot Noir, some Pinot Meunier, some Chardonnay in each of the three areas. Uh, but this is definitely the terroir which expresses the most and the best of each variety. And so that's definitely one map which is very interesting and which is showcasing what, what uh, is Champagne in, in general. Um, Champagne is also one of the only area, AOC area in France to actually be divided into two parts. So the major part, which is the one where we are, and you can see that there is a little point with Chalon Champagne where, I'm, where I am right now. And of course, Reims and Epernay. Um, and then you have the second part of Champagne, which is important uh, to remember, which is the Côte de Bar, um, closer to Burgundy. And between those two areas, you're going to have close to 100 kilometers um, um, differences, uh, which is not uh, vineyards, which is mostly agricultural field. So this is very unusual. Um, we're not the only one, but this is unusual to find an appellation divided into two uh, areas uh, with such a distance between the two. Um, so 84,000 acres, um, that's definitely also something important because this is a small um, area. Um, I will now go through the 10 step exactly, but this is a good reminder again of what we need to follow uh, from the manual harvest. Important to remember that we can't use the machine to harvest in Champagne. Um, the press which are made the closest to the vineyards, we don't press anything in the cellars. Um, we're going to go through, you know, alcoholic fermentation and malolactic fermentation, of course, like any other wine. Um, then we're going to wait for approximately six months before going into the blending process. Uh, usually the blending starts around March, ending in April. Um, so we just ended the blend of the 2019 harvest a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then start, of course, um, you know, um, the bottling, the second fermentation, and the aging uh, for the amount of year that you want to, um, to, to do, but the minimum must be 15 for non-vintage and 36 for vintage. So uh, very quick on this slide, um, because this is, not, this is a masterclass, but I like to make it also fun and informative. This is not the objective to actually concentrate on each step, but you'll have the presentation, you can definitely keep it right. Okay, um, I'll do again. Um, this is much more interesting and much more informative for me. 
compared to 10 sentences. Here you have some drawing of the method champenois. And this is actually explaining quite well um, where, where it's starting and where it's ending uh, between, of course, the vines, the press, fermentation, the bottling, uh, blend, sorry, and second fermentation, and then the aging, disgorgement, and then the drinking. So this is a nice drawing uh, that I think is very interesting and is explaining pretty well of being the only one in the city. Um, the second point, which is very important as well for being here, is the fact that we are enjoying some fantastic sellers. Um, Chuck um, and of course uh, Emily sold the sellers a couple of months ago. Uh, we enjoyed three kilometers of sellers, um, but the particularity is the fact that they are on one single level. So you could actually do your three kilometers without taking any stairs, which is very unique in Champagne as well. And the most, the oldest one, sorry, I dating back from the Roman Empire. So definitely something very unique, very unusual, and something to discover. I'm sure you can discuss with Chuck and Emily and, and they'll tell you about it. It's a fantastic place uh, to be. We talk about the vineyard that we own, of course, very important because we not only a house buying grape, we also manage vineyards. We own vineyards, 22 hectares, um, which are mostly alongside the Marne River, um, and especially in Cumière and Auvillé. Um, so Cumière and Auvillé, both premier cru village, and by the way, the family house as well is also based in Cumière. So we have strong roots in Cumière. So this is where we're going to find um, you know, some of our oldest vineyards. And for those of you who know a little bit the, um, the ranch of Joseph Perrier, uh, we actually launched um, a couple of years ago a parcel selection uh, of Pinot Noir, which are coming from the oldest vineyards, which is right in Cumier. It's definitely very important in the history of the family and of the house. Um, we usually mention the style of Joseph Perrier because Champagne is also always about a certain style. And definitely, um, originally since the beginning, the objective was to work on producing balanced, fresh and fruity wine. And those three words are very important in the description we can do uh, of um, Joseph Perrier and the style of Joseph Perrier. And this is also what leads, uh, you know, in the 19th century, uh, the British royal family and especially Queen Victoria to actually select Joseph Perrier uh, at their champagne, official champagne. And this is why today um, the main range of the house is actually called the Cuvée Royal, Royal Cuvée. Uh, it's definitely coming from this link that we have the, with the British royal family. So, Long story, um, family story, we are houses buying grapes everywhere, but also managing and owning vineyards. Um, those fantastic cellars, which are definitely very important in the aging of our wines. Um, the, the story alongside those, the past two centuries we have is also fantastic. So it's a, it's a beautiful little jewel, uh, Joseph Perrier, and definitely uh, we are very, very proud of what we have uh, in our hands and also very humble to be able to actually uh, explain and show um, what we do. So, this is Joseph Peyer, so just a quick drawing. Nice gentleman. Um, so, we discuss about the few points that we have um, uh, and the quality point of Joseph Peyer. And of course, we discuss about cela. So um, this presentation is always going through a little bit of cellars because I really hope one day you'll be able to come and visit us in Champagne uh, because um, it's always what I'm saying when I'm meeting people all over the world. I'm always saying I could talk hours about Joseph Perrier, about Champagne in general, but it will never replace you coming to Champagne and seeing it with your own eyes. I think it's just impossible for me to replace that feeling, that sensation that you have when you are in the vineyard and you really understand exactly what uh, everyone traveling all over the world to talk about it is actually talking about. So just a lot, very important in the history of the house, of course. Um, there were those cellars originally, they were not made for champagne aging, but they were built by the Roman because they wanted to get the chalk in order to make the buildings. 
Um, and that's why when you come one day, you'll see that there is a big difference between the older stellas and the younger stellas uh, in terms of size. Uh, so there is also something very particular in the stellar is the fact that since we are on one single level, there is on the top of the cellar a park um, where we have actually created some, um, some uh, access uh, to the cellar. So there is some links between the parks upstairs and the cellars. And the idea was actually to bring light and oxygen into the cellars. So if you come one day, you'll see that you have some light holes which are just bringing the light and help us to actually see in the cellars um, it, 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 like if we were in a, in a normal day, light, uh, but of course without damaging at all uh, the bottle. And it's really something unique and particular uh, to, to Chalon Champagne and to Joseph Perry. So the bottles are lying down through the gallery, of course, we perfect condition of constant temperature and light, as I say, and it's definitely part of the history of, of Joseph Perry. And again, I invite you to come because, and this is what I was talking about, you know, this um, light coming from upstairs, from the park upstairs, which is actually reflecting uh, on some metal pieces that we've installed uh, in the cellar. And the light is actually going into each uh, caves. And it's very, very unique to see that. Okay, so just uh, a few things control. Um, wanted, of course, after the cellars, um, to discuss a bit about the vineyard and the farming philosophy, uh, because this is also something which is very important uh, in our approach, um, in our philosophy, in our state of mind. It's definitely how do we handle, uh, you know, our vineyards and what do we do with them. So here is a map a little bit different than the other one, uh, a little bit more usual for those who know the little bit Champagne, you certainly saw that map already. Um, so you can see Chalon Champagne where I am right now, which is right in the middle uh, of Champagne, close to Epernay and close as well to Rennes, it's only 30 minutes driving. Um, you can see a couple of other, you know, smaller part of the appellation like the Cris François Cézanne and of course the Côte des Barres. So the Joseph Perry vineyard, as I said, we're talking about 22 hectares, which are divided into 34 parcels. Um, and what's important to know, even if we don't communicate too much about it, is the fact that 7.5 hectares are to certified organics, uh, so on two parcels. And of course, we have this Demetra certification possibility, which is also very interesting. Uh, but the idea here is definitely to for quite a long time now to be able to manage your vineyards in an organic philosophy and not obligatory to make it kind of a standpoint. Um, we definitely consider, and of course, like many of our colleagues in Champagne, and we can talk about many houses who are doing the same and following the same philosophy, um, it's becoming an obligation. And because of course, all what we can see at the moment around us and the situation we're facing now is part of it. Uh, it's important that we do things a little bit differently, that we respect a little bit more and we understand a little bit more the links between us, nature, the vines, the grapes and everything. And definitely this uh, organic um, management is very important for us. Um, so all of them are located alongside the Marne River. So Cumière, Auvillère, uh, Damry and Verneuil, a little bit further down uh, the river. Uh, but as you can see, 22 hectares only represents only 25% of our sourcing, which means we are going to buy 75% of the grapes that you, we are using to make our wines, uh, which can sound a lot. And in the meantime, as I said earlier in the presentation, what makes the beauty of Champagne is also this diversity, this diversity of terroir, not only grapes, but terroir, to be able to go and pick up some Chardonnay in Verzi, in the north of the Montagne de Reims, or uh, Pinot Noir, for example, and to be able to pick up some Pinot Noir from Bouzy in the south, which are going uh, to show very, very different and diverse, um, diverse personality and identity. And I really think um, that this is also what is interesting to be able to, of course, manage your own vineyards, know your land, know your soil, of course, 
but to be able to go and work and discover with the diversity of what is Champagne to you. And this is making a strong link with, you know, and all my colleagues will tell the same thing with, this is also why Champagne is unique. Champagne is unique because this is only one appellation and Champagne is unique because we are not only defending one single area. We are using a lot of different areas. So we are defending Champagne in its all. And then we are just following a certain style that we are just convinced that it's a fantastic one. But that's a very, very different story. Um, so great sourcing, of course, Montagne de Reims and Côte des Blancs for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay this is definitely where we're going to try to source most of our grapes. We are also a strong, um, let's say, buyer, grapes buyer from this small area. Uh, I'm going back to the uh, to this area right there called Vitry Francois, uh, because this particular area of the appellation has a strong story. Um, originally, um, the quality of the grapes there was not definitely recognized as the best in the 50s and in the 60s. And there were a small group of growers who were convinced about the quality of this area in the 60s who actually decided to go and meet the Champagne House and ask them to, you know, do what they needed to do to, to help them to build up, to increase the quality of the area. And of course, the first city when they're going to Rennes that they meet and that they go through is Chalon Champagne. And Chalon Champagne, they arrive. The only Champagne house still there is Joseph Perrier. And of course, they enter Chalon Joseph Perrier and they get into the office, which is right behind me. And they meet the uncle of Jean-Claude and great uncle of Benjamin. And they say that, okay, listen, we have these vineyards, we need some help to increase the quality, but we, we cannot do that by our own. We need your, your knowledge. We need exactly your, uh, what you know about you know, the, 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 the process and everything. So um, Georges Pitois, so the uncle of Jean-Claude and great uncle of Benjamin, uh, actually said to them, no problem at all. Um, we definitely be helping you, but we definitely would like to get some of your grapes in order to make our wines. So we've been one of the biggest buyer of these grapes, this area, uh, since 1972, uh, which is mostly Chardonnay. And strangely enough, this area today is certainly one of the most, you know, uh, advertised and the most, let's say, um, attractive area uh, for Chardonnay because of very specific things. The soil over there is very different to the soil of the Côte des Blancs. When in the Côte des Blancs, you have this strong chalky layer in the soil, in Vitry Francois, so in this small area that you can see right there, it's going to be a mix of chalk and marley soil. And this is mix of chalk and marley soil is going to help to express a better freshness of the Chardonnay grapes. And this is very interesting how nowadays, for the past maybe 10 years, uh, here in Champagne, and certainly a little bit due to the climatic change, due to a change of you know consumption trending as well, we are trying to increase the freshness expression of our wines. And at Joseph Perrier, the freshness has been you know the basis of our style for you know almost 60 years, and that's something amazing to be able to really count on that area. Uh, today, uh, when you use the story and the link between us. So that's definitely a very important of the style of, uh, of Joseph Perrier. Um, Bringing the philosophy uh, of the grapes and of our own vineyards, um, that's also something which is important since we have the organic affair. Um, the rest of the vineyard is not certified yet, uh, but of course we have uh, used the same uh, philosophy than for the organic, which means the decrease of the chemicals, to compare to the average of 75 persons. Uh, we use some technology, so we use some drones and some scanner of the vineyards to actually really understand how the soil is made. Um, we're trying to develop the biodiversity in the soil, which is very important, and it's a big word now into the world of Champagne and even in the, the big house, talking about the biodiversity. But it's a big word because it's so important. Um, again, for the expression of our wines and for the future of our wines as well. Um, so we are trying a lot of different experiences, talking you know, about the enlarging of the row uh, spacing, talking about for the manual work, the organic compost and fertilizer that we use a lot, 
uh, the trees plantation. There is a lot of technique today that we are trying to utilize in our vineyards, but again, never with the objective of, you know, making the organic world only a sales and marketing standpoint. And I think it's very important. We are in a philosophy much more than you know, trying to sell more champagne just because it's organic. It's not really very interesting. And that's part also of the family of Jean-Claude Benjamin and the family FOMO uh, since the beginning to actually always try to take the best of the soil and you know to respect the soil as well. So just a quick picture of vineyards and um, if again if you come one day uh, you'll go through that road because this is a, the, what we call the Route des Grand Cru, the uh, you know Grand Cru road uh, where you can go in through our vineyards and you can see right at the back the Man River that I was talking uh, I was talking about and it's a nice picture taken from you know Ovile um, and which is yeah, the village you can see at the back, it's, uh, it's Cumia, this is uh, the family village. Um, all right, so um, I've been talking, you know, about Champagne, I've been talking about Joseph Perrier, who we are, where we're coming from, um, this family affair. Um, now I think it's a good thing to start and talk about why we are all here. So I'm sorry that to be the only one to actually have a glass of champagne in my hand. I, I hope that everyone could have a glass as well to share. And I'll definitely make a cheers to everyone. Uh, but um, it's certainly a much better time for me at 8 o'clock p.m. than you at 2.30. It might be a little bit too early. Um, despite champagne is never too early, but that's a different story. I um, wanted to start um, this little, you know, tasting, you know, to talk about the cuvee. Not by the usual route, um, because it's definitely uh, a very important point for us. But I think in the tasting, I love to start with the Blanc de Blanc. Um, Blanc de Blanc is definitely, you know, one of the trendy quality at the moment in Champagne. And for Joseph Bay, it's been a strong, strong love affair uh, between Chardonnay and Joseph Bay. Um, we've been, you know, making Blanc de Blanc for very, very long. We were one of the first to produce a Blanc de Blanc at a huge, you know, level. And it's definitely one of the qualities that um, usually don't need to talk too much about it when you taste it. It's just talk by itself. Um, that's also the interest. Um, so under Person Chardonnay, of course, 15 different crews coming from, you know, um, multiple amount of different areas, but mostly the Côte des Blancs, of course, which is where you're going to find the Premier de Grand Cru, and the Bastuet. So the Bastuet is, you know, this little area as we discussed about, where we are actually buying most of the grapes, um, and the Vitry Francois, and so they are producing Chardonnay mostly, and this is definitely also uh, why um, our Blanc de Blanc is so expressive, is so unique, it's also because of this, you know, impact of the Chardonnay com coming from these particular areas. Um, and there is also something which is very interesting. We are using a little bit of Chardonnay coming from our own vineyard in Cumier. Uh, Cumier, if you remember, which is normally a Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, sorry, uh, terroir. Uh, so it's very interesting to have some Chardonnay uh, actually planted and grown uh, right aside the, the Pinot Noir. Um, so it's a wine, and again, which is going to be defining a little bit than the brute, but always with this idea of focusing on balance, freshness, fruitiness. But of course, to start the tasting, it's fantastic to have the Blanc de Blanc, because you're going to have this very nice and light smell of lemon, white flowers, and very easy, you know, a nice smell. And on the palate, it's gonna be also something which is very uh, easy drinking. And I am not afraid of using the word easy drinking because uh, we always consider that we are producing wine for people to actually drink them. And it's fantastic with the Blanc Blanc to be able to read really every wine which is fresh, simple, easily enjoyable. It's a complex wine coming from Chardonnay from the Côte des Blancs, from Premier Cru and all that, but doesn't avoid the fact that we want 
wine for people to drink them and to enjoy them very easily. And usually what I say is, okay, I want, you know, you people taking a glass, we talk five, 10 minutes and you didn't even realize that we've talked 10 minutes and you've drank two glasses of Blanc de Blanc. This is exactly what we are expecting from, you know, our, our guests most of the time. Very refreshing, especially after the warm there. It's really fantastic. Um, we take the example of the oysters uh, for the pairings, but there is a multitude amount of possibilities uh, with that wine. Um, that's definitely uh, on its own, which I think it's still the best for me, um, the most interesting. It's really a wine to be enjoyed by itself with some friends, you know, six, seven o'clock after a warm day. It's absolutely fantastic. So as you can see, we're also using glasses which are not fruit, and of course that you are aware about that. It's not a surprise, but that's something which is very important. So the second which I would like to discuss about um, is also an important wine, which is going to be uh, rosé. I don't know if the trend of rosé is still the same in the States, uh, but I used to live in the States about 10 years ago and at that time rosé was just, you know, um, just a killer, you know, the, the, the growth of the rosé sale were absolutely amazing and, and impressive. Uh, I suppose it's been stabilized a little bit, but you still, I think, drink quite a good amount of rosé wines. And for Champagne, it's according to me quite uh, the same story, and we've seen really good growth uh, in the past few word, years. Um, strangely enough, not replacing, but almost replacing, you know, some of the Brit by the Rosé and the Blanc de Blanc. So it's very interesting also how the consumer is getting more and more, you know, understanding um, about what Champagne and, and, and the difference between just a couple of years is really impressive. So, you know that we have also in Champagne something very particular that we have different ways to make rosés, of course, that I'm not teaching you anything. You have, of course, let's say the most generic one for making rosés in France, uh, which we call the skin fermentation. Um, this is certainly the least used uh, method for rosé uh, in Champagne. And we are not uh, outside this trend because this rosé that we are doing is a blended rosé. So which means we're going to be blending uh, red wine and white wine in order to realize that rosé. So this rosé is going to be as you can read on the screen, uh, mostly Pinot, Noir and Meunier, so coming from, of course, our vineyards. Um, the also very important things, and that's much more about the link between the family and this particular terroir, is the fact that the red wine is coming exclusively from our um, vineyards in Cumière. Uh, so it's a Premier Cru red steel wine that we use for making um, that rosé and that's also part of you know the style and what we present to the consumer at the moment and of course some chardonnay uh, in order to bring that that freshness the color is also very interesting we're not trying to actually have a very strong deep color we're trying to have a color uh, which is much more uh, looking like you know Côte de Provence rosé something orangey not too pinky something very, um, you know, um, pleasant to watch. And because rosé, again, it must be a pleasant to drink, but also it must be a pleasure to watch as well in a glass. And very important to have that color. We wanted to have, again, this very particular style, not having a too much, too big impression of red wine into uh, our rosé. Um, we want to follow the philosophy and those three words that we were discussing about when describing what is Joseph Pay in terms of style, talking about balance, freshness, and fruitiness. And that's definitely a perfect example of what is the Joseph Pay Cuvée Royale Brut Rosé for us. 
very nice nose, strong character, a little bit of green pepper. That's something very, very nice. And I hope again that the next time I'm in the States, I'll be able to actually really enjoy a glass with you and not being the only one to drink champagne in front of the rest. Because champagne is always a question of sharing with people. It sounds a little bit selfish to drink champagne on its own. It's great, it's easily, again, drinkable. Of course, a little bit, a little bit more intense, you got this Pinot Noir expression, uh, which is definitely the mark uh, of the Pinot Noir in Champagne, and definitely giving much more power uh, to the wine. But again, you keep that balance, you keep that freshness, you keep that long-lasting sensation, which is also very important. The picture actually in the presentation shows, um, um, my God, I forgot that word that uh, you see. Well, <laughs> I forgot that word, a uh, lobster, sorry. Um, but it's definitely uh, one of the solutions we could use for that pairing. What I love to do with the rosé, and I offer you the possibility to try, is actually to pair it with some red meat and especially some duck. And if you one day you want to try some, you know, uh, a piece of bread grilled with a little bit of duck magret on the top, some basil leaf, olive oil. It's a fantastic bouche aperitif, and the fattiness of the duck with the rosé is really very interesting in terms of balance. Mm -hmm. Matthew, while Chuck and I were visiting Joseph Perrier, um, your staff also told us that champagne rosé and barbecue is a fantastic pairing, which barbecue is very popular here in the States. Um, yeah. That was Absolutely. one where I know Chuck and my our mouths were watering when they started talking about that. <laughs> Absolutely. But it's great, I mean, because... Because it's, if you think about barbecue, usually you think about a you know, huge Malbec, huge Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, which is going to just show, you know, a 15 or 16 degree alcohol. And you're going to have a glass, maybe two glasses, and then you're feeling a little bit like, okay, a little bit tired. The beauty of champagne, it's you never stop drinking it, you know. You just get one glass, get a second one, get a third glass, and you don't even realize that you finish the bottle after 15 minutes. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Champagne is, you know, the best drink for pairing with everything you can think about. You just need to find out exactly these little nuts that could be bearable, but it's actually quite easy to pair. Champagne is the most easy, easy wine to actually be paired with any food. And barbecue is an option. Uh, me, I'm very French, I'm very chauvinistic, so I'm going to talk about duck magrette and my, you know, little potatoes and persils and berto, of course, uh, but I'm very French, so <laughs> it's totally normal. Uh, but everything is really possible, and this is really the interesting thing uh, about it. All right, um, then we're going to talk about what makes um, Joseph Perrier what it is today. Um, I did, as I told you, I didn't start with it, but it's definitely, let's say, the major quality for the FBA. It represents close to, you know, 75% of the wine that we produce. The global production of Joseph Perrier is the Brut Classic Non-Vintage. Um, we need to go back, so. Yes, almost, yes, exactly. Um, so this is definitely the expression of the house style. This is uh, what makes Joseph Trey, why, why Joseph Trey has been so famous uh, all over the world uh, in the 50 plus countries we are distributed today. Um, this is definitely this brief, you know, non-vintage. It's elegant, fresh, light, well-balanced. Um, this is the perfect expression and description of the three words I've been using at the beginning of the presentation talking about balance, freshness, and fruitiness. This one is definitely uh, the quintessence of what is uh, Joseph Perrier. You know, that's definitely a, a major player uh, of our success. Um, so definitely, when you talk about Nathalie, our chef de cave, she will uh, tell you that most of the time, the most difficult wine to make is not the prestige cuvee, or it's not the vintage cuvee, because 
this is actually quite easy. Prestige of vintage, you know, both are coming from either good vintages or, you know, the best grapes or the best terroir. So it's usually quite easy to make. The most complicated one to make is definitely the brick non-vintage because this is a style of the house, first of all. So you need to be very, you know, strict on what makes that style. And because you need to actually repeat that style year after year. Um, it's a very difficult exercise that Natalie is actually doing uh, every year. So that yellow label, as we call it as well, um, we are going to use the three varietals. As again, you can read on the text sheet, it's going to be, um, uh, you know, 35 Chardonnay, 35 Pinot Noir and some Pinot Meunier. Um, we have some reserve wine um, in it as well, as you can read. Um, it's also the most, you know, uh, diverse and complex, um, you know, grapes origin. So we have more than 20 village uh, that we use for blending that wine. Um, so you can think about, you know, the blending station and having a huge table with maybe 45, 50 different crew right in front of you. Uh, so you have just a little bit of the Chardonnay, just a little bit of the Pinot Noir and just trying to, you know, to find a balance. So it's exactly uh, what the analogical team is doing every year, trying to find back the essence of Joseph Bayer of this quality uh, by uh, also, let's say, using the quality of each vintage we're talking about. So it's a complicated job. But definitely, immediately on the nose, you feel that it's a little bit more powerful, even compared to the rosé. The rosé was powerful, but a little bit more fruity. Uh, here you have less that fruit or you have a different kind of fruit flavors. Um, this power is coming immediately on the nose. Uh, is definitely a much bigger wine than the Blanc de Blanc. And this is also why I'm tasting the range that way. Start with the Blanc de Blanc, the lightest, freshest style, and then you go up and up into the tasting in order to reach, you know, the most complex and expressive wine. So very open, easy welcoming style as it's written on the sheet. It's floral, it's fruity. So enjoyable immediately. Um, it's usually the wine, what I like to do uh, when making that wine, it's usually something very simple. Thinking, for example, about the Caesar salad. You know, you, your little chicken breast, you know, your iceberg salad and a little bit of Parmigiano Reggiano and it's an absolute delice um, between this wine and the, and the Caesar salad. But you have a lot of other examples of pairing that is possible with that point, but I love to actually pair it with white meat. I've also heard that maybe Emily, you can tell me if I'm right, but I've heard that in the state there is a new trend about champagne and popcorn or champagne and chicken wings. Uh, is it still the case? Yes, uh, champagne and fried chicken in particular is a really big um, trend here in the States because you get kind of the, the fattiness and the butter and the crispiness on the chicken and then the yeah. acidity and the freshness and the champagne just cuts right through that. Um, okay. I know I did I did champagne and fried chicken for my New Year's Eve celebration so. Wow, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I was not totally crazy. I really heard about that. Oh no, it's definitely, it's a big one. Champagne and popcorn I haven't tried though. I think the next time I go to the movies I'll have to smuggle in a, a bottle of champagne. Exactly. Instead of taking a, a, a Coke or whatever, hey. you're taking a glass of champagne. It's really <laughs> <laughs> so it's beautiful wine, really. The, the, if you come one day and you'll hear Jean-Claude or Benjamin talk about that quality, they'll, they'll always tell you, of course, we've always wanted people to drink our wine. So we're trying to produce wine which are really easily understandable and easily drinkable. But definitely the Brut Nord Vitae is the best expression of this idea, of this philosophy. Um, the formal family is a family that is sharing a lot with people. We always welcome people. We share uh, dinner, lunch with people. We love that. And this is definitely also the identity of this family that you're going to find as well into that wine. And I think it's very important um, to understand the, the man behind each wine 
you know, um, they always try to reflect a little bit the personality into the wine. And I think it's definitely what you have right now with this uh, Cuvée Royal Brut. So I've seen a question about the, the amount of vintages into um, the Cuvée Royal Brut, right, uh, Emily? Yeah, Travis was asking um, how many different vintages are usually included in the Cuvée Royal Brut. So um, it, it really depends. The thing is, we're using some uh, reserve wine, of course. Uh, we are uh, the tendency to actually um, do a little bit like a Solera system for the reserve wine, which, mean, which means, of course, you all know what is a Solera, which means we're going to mix, uh, you know, a little bit of each harvest all together uh, in order to maintain a certain, you know, um, not standardization, but a certain quality standard uh, year after year. So you could have approximately four to five different um, years um, and harvest uh, into a normal Cuvée Royale quit, but of course at a very different percentage. I'll make, um, I'll make vintage champagne. Okay, I'll discuss about that later. No problem. I was sorry, I was reading the question at the same time. Uh, are you? Okay, no problem. Yes, of course. And we're going to the vintage champagne section. So, uh, number four for the tasting. Um, that was also for us very important to focus on um, the main range of Joseph Bayer for you know, this event. We are going to introduce our vintage champagne. So, 2008 vintage champagne. This is a current vintage uh, that we have. Um, definitely for those who know the little bit champagne and the vintage champagne, you know that age is considered as certainly one of the top best vintages in the, in, in the past two decades. Um, you would say it's actually quite simple. You're going to have, let's say, 2000, 2002, um, four, but it was a little bit more heterogeneous, like six. Eight is definitely fantastic, but eight is very strange because if you ask um, at the end of July 2008 to the wine grower in Champagne, if they think that it's going to be a good vintage, they're all going to tell you that it's going to be a very, very complicated vintage. Because eight was a very strange year. Eight was very cold um, um, in the beginning in January. Um, until mid-February, end of February. Then you got, uh, let's say, quite a warm weather with some rains, which accelerates a little bit, you know, the growing period. And then April, you had a period of, you know, very cold weather again, so which definitely didn't help to actually uh, generate some, you know, um, stability into the vineyard. And then, the weather was okay, but not that sunny, you know, we were missing a little bit of sun. We got, of course, some sun in July, but there is a kind of a lack of sun until the end of July. And the back seasons, August until September was really fantastic. And the back season really, you know, changed everything. And that is why today this vintage is very interesting because it's a fantastic balance between these, you know, dryness, acidity, minerality, which is definitely helps to gain some long lasting potential, some aging potential. And in the meantime, you got that pour, that intensity from that fantastic back season, which is definitely helps to counterbalance the acidity. So it's a beautiful wine and beautiful year for that reason, for that specific year. Um, cool year, but also kind of strange year. So that's why the world and everyone in Champagne was not so sure about what was going to be, um, you know, the vintage like maybe five, six, seven years later. And if you look like how many 2008 are in the shelves today, it's really fantastic to still be able to uh, discuss about that vintage altogether. Because this is a current release, huh? oh my God. Not happening all the time. And this is a current release. And we still have a couple of years in front of us with 
that particular vintage. So it's really very, very lucky that we are to have those. So as you can see on the sheet, it's actually mostly Chardonnay, but it's, let's say, quite equal because you're going to have 50 Chardonnay and the rest is going to be Pinot, more mostly and a little bit of Meunier. Coming from Premier and Grand Crubinards only. And you can read a couple of them. Most famous one, of course, Le Ménil, Chouilly, Cumière, Mailly. So again, to play on the diversity um, of the Champagne terroir, if you go to the northern side of the Montagne de Reims, which is facing north and so a lot of wind and usually a little bit more colder, a little bit more mineral and acidity. And when you take a little bit more, the southern part of the Montagne de Reims, giving a little bit more power and fruitiness. So, that's always that balance, which is absolutely fantastic and what we're looking for. It's a pronounced fruit. It's still amazing 12 years later to have this freshness coming. It's so beautiful, so, so, so ready to drink now, but you can definitely put a couple of bottles back in the fridge and, or in your cellar and just forget them a little bit. This vintage has the potential to last much longer than any other. And it's always a question, and I know that in the past the question was asked to say, okay, shall we just, you know, release the eight or maybe switch directly to the nine because the nine was much more warmer. And when you taste the eight, you say, okay, I'm happy to have the eight now, but you have to admit that um, certainly that the eight will last much longer than the nine, and you should definitely drink the 2009 before the 2008. So that's very interesting how such a stranger became so emblematic, became so iconic to, to Champagne. Absolutely fantastic, and uh, I wish you were with me and we could open that bottle all together, or Magnum maybe, much better for the number we are. But uh, definitely, absolutely fantastic. The, the possibility of pairing as well with that wine is just amazing. Uh, you think about a lot of different things. Uh, we, we take the foie gras as an example because, let's say, a good foie gras is always absolutely fantastic, but uh, there is a lot of other possibilities, you know, we're talking about, you know, these um, scallops um, carpaccio, uh, which definitely could be an exception. Um, you talk about the foie gras, of course, we can talk about, you know, um, a couple of um, a meringue, uh, a couple of chestnut, a couple of cheese as well. Um, but some of the red meat can be very interesting as well, you know, some of, you know, some veal, some um, pig or beef, you know, when you don't have too much of this sauce, which is usually uh, taking a little bit everything, overwhelming everything in the palate, when you just, you know, going straight to the meat, it's very interesting to find, you know, that nice nuts of pairing between the good red meat and this wine. It's a beautiful, beautiful wine. We are so lucky to have that here, you know. So 2008, um, great vintage, and we are lucky enough, and I'm answering the question that I've seen on the screen. Of course, we do have vintage, and we produce more vintage champagne than non-vintage champagne. Um, we're going to produce um, five non-vintage champagne, all in the Cuvée Royal range, and all the vintage champagne are going to be in two other ranges. So only for this one, which is Cuvée Royal, this is the only vintage of the Cuvée Royal, but then we have um, four other wines, which are definitely um, very interesting. Two are called the Esprit de Victoria. So if you remember, we used to be the sole supplier of Champagne to Queen Victoria. So it's an honorific cuvee to the Queen Victoria. So we have the Blanc de Blanc Vintage, the 2010 Extra Brut, and the Rosé Brut 2010. Um, so definitely also amazing. And Emily and Chuck can discuss about uh, them with you as well. Um, we have a parcel selection. You remember that we have this big vineyard, a fantastic vineyard in Cumière, uh, 22 hectares. And the oldest part of the vineyard is in Cumière, and we decided to select that vineyard and to make a parcel selection. So we are producing 7,000 bottles of these parcels in Cumière. 
called La Cota Bra. And it's a very interesting wine because this is a brut nature, so zero dosage wine, blanc de noir, made of 100% Pinot Noir, 20, now today, 2011, but it's a vintage every year. And this is an experiment that we wanted to make. We wanted to produce wine from this particular terroir every year. We didn't want to select if it was a good year or a bad year. We wanted to see the transition and we wanted to see how it was following up to each other. So it's very interesting to see the differences. We released the first vintage was 2008 and now we are in 2011. And it's very interesting to see that qualities are parcel selection, how the wine is evolving considering the vintage. Um, 11 was a very interesting vintage, but definitely not one of the best. But 2012, which is coming, and 2010, which is right before, were absolutely and will be absolutely fantastic. And 10 was just terrific. So it's very interesting. It's much more kind of an experimental, uh, you know, vineyard and definitely different approach, um, kind of a burgundy approach uh, with that particular parcel. And of course, last but not least, and here I need to stand up and take an example. I'm sure you've heard about my dear friend. So let's see if I can just show you that on the screen. Exactly. <coughs> so Josephine. Um, Josephine is a prestige cuvée of the house um, and the current vintage is 2008 and Josephine is a fantastic story. Uh, just to make it short, Josephine was um, the daughter of Joseph Pey. And when she got married in 1843, uh, a very nice daddy decided to create a single bottle just for the wedding. So he went to Epernay and asked a painter to actually design that particular drawing on the bottle. And of course, it was a beautiful wedding, everything went well, and the bottles were all consumed. Uh, and fortunately enough, we are lucky that one bottle was kept by the family through the generation. And in 1978, when Jean-Claude, so Benjamin's father, um, took over the house after his uncle, um, he's entering the office right behind me and in the middle of the shelves, he see that bottle coming from that wedding in 1843. And so he just stay right in front of that bottle and say, we cannot let that bottle just on the shelf. We need to use it. We need to do something with it. And so he decided to create that cuvee, cuvee Josephine, to make it a prestige cuvee. And the philosophy is not to make Josephine every vintage of all year. So you know that we don't make vintage champagne every year, but with Josephine, we don't make Josephine every vintage of all year. So to give you an idea, in 40 years of existence of the Josephine Cuvée, we only released 10 vintages. So that's giving you an idea of the rarity of that one. Um, Lucky enough to have two 2008 in a range today. So the Prestige Cuvée and the Cuvée Royal Range. And if you are lucky enough to taste the Josephine and to compare it with the 2008, you'll see that it's very interesting how they are expressing very different. But such a, an iconic Cuvée for us is just a, a beautiful and elemental story, part of the story of the family and of the house. So which makes exactly five vintage wine today um, in the portfolio in the range of Joseph Perrier. So we do more vintage wine than non-vintage. Um, just it's always a story of we consider that it's of course very important to learn about Joseph Perrier with the Cuvée Royale and then step by step to step up into the world of those very particular uh, different qualities. Mm -hmm. Mathieu, we had a question from Fabrice as well, asking if you, if Joseph Perrier makes 300 and 375 milliliter bottles as well. Absolutely. Uh, we do 375 for the Brut and the Rosé, so Brut non-vintage and Rosé non-vintage. 
Wonderful. I know yeah. Travis had some more um, technical questions as well. Travis, yeah. did you want to go ahead and ask those? Sure. Yeah, I was curious uh, what type of a press you use. Do you use a, a cocard press or more modern technology? Uh, we're going to use both because we don't um, press our grips uh, all in the same places. So, sure. so Probably. you know, nowadays what's developing a lot in Champagne is you have a lot of independent press a little bit everywhere. Um, so most of the time it's still very the modern technology press, to be honest. We still have some cocard, of course, uh, but it's, it's going to be a mix of the both. Let's see. Um, I had another more general champagne question for you mm -hmm. regarding uh, Rabesh or uh, third pressing. Yeah. Uh, I've seen that that's, that's required by law in various numbers from 0 to 10% or 1 to 10%. Is it actual or required? Is there an actual requirement for uh, doing a third pressing? And if so, what do you do? You do anything with it? To do a third pressing. So yeah, um, so you have three press absolutely. The first one is la cuvée, la cuvée. The second one is la taille. So just for your information, for example, when you see uh, champagne and it's written cuvée on the label, uh, it's an obligation that all the wines are coming from the first press. So that's something which is very important. QV is not only a marketing standpoint, it's also um, a legal, uh, legal point into the, the appellation. So we do mostly the QV. Uh, of course, we do a little bit of tie, but mostly it's not what we are focusing on. And the rest is for many, many years, we've done some Ratafia and some Mar de Champagne. Uh, but what we don't do it anymore. Uh, so we actually send everything to the distillery. I see. Yeah. Is there is there a specific minimum percentage uh, that you must that you're required to to press for a third pressing? Uh, that's a pretty good question. And since I'm not sure about the answer, I prefer to tell you that I don't know, and uh, I prefer to tell you that I will check. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. You know, when I don't know, I prefer not to say anything. Not at all. So no, I will check. That's a very interesting question. I will check that. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, do any experimentation with uh, with the other permitted grapes like uh, Arbonne or, or Pinot Blanc Fry? Or, uh, uh, okay, so um, we are doing experimentation, but not at the level that you can actually, you know, see a difference in the wine tasting. Sure which means this is much more experimental on the vineyard management than really on bringing something very particular, very specific to the um, style of the wine. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. If you see what I mean. Any other question? I'm trying to go on, the, on this. But I... oh, that's what you said, okay. Any other particular question that you had about, uh, you know, the range and the Josephine? And... <laughs> Good question about the UK. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's a pretty good question uh, and um, I have to admit, and then maybe I shouldn't say that, but uh, I have to admit that I've tasted some of the English sparkling wine and I have to admit that they are doing pretty good quality wine over there. And I was kind of surprised, happily surprised with what I've tasted so far. Um, the, the answer I have is still remains always the same. Um, I'm convinced that they are able to actually produce some great wine over there, but I'm also convinced that um, we have, let's say, almost you know um, more than three centuries uh, of advance uh, compared to our English friends in the terroir management. Uh, we know our terroir very well. Uh, the Champagne terroir is very specific. Um, and I consider that you don't read the quality level of champagne um, in just a small amount of time, it's impossible. Um, so to know if we're going to buy vineyards over there in UK, I would say they are constantly uh, thinking about it, uh, especially since um, the United Kingdom is certainly um, our biggest market, uh, export market today. 
and or historically speaking you'll understand that it's easy with the link with the British royal family and the Queen Victoria we have always been strong in the UK um, but in the meantime so we are aware of many opportunities but in the meantime so far we didn't move forward in that direction um, doesn't mean we'll never do it but so far it is not in the plan Any uh, all the things that's coming into your head, please ask. Okay, we'll go to, um, so I'll go very fast on this because this is, um, let's say the part of the presentation. This is a beautiful um, limited edition magnum that we've made with an artist called Laurent Collin. And it, it's a fantastic wine as well. Uh, very, very, very limited. I think, Emilian, check you, you, you do have a little bit in stock. I'm not sure about it. I don't remember. I'll have to double check with Chuck. I know we, we discussed it at Wine Paris for sure. Yeah, it, it's a fantastic. Uh, you know, Laurent Collin is a young French artist who's actually um, working on the paper. And you know that the paper is actually made of different layers of very thin paper. And she's just working with a scalpel and creating some, um, some uh, framework and some some design. It's a beautiful lesson making and she's uh, accepted to actually uh, create that uh, design for us. Um, so it, it's just uh, one of the, you know, very limited edition that we are uh, creating sometimes. We are very proud of this partnership. Uh, and one is time inside is absolutely fantastic, especially in my name, in the person Chardonnay. Yeah, to the blanc is like to the blanc. It's like blanc de blanc, absolutely. It's 100 percent Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, uh, it's not a declared vintage. Uh, because we wanted to focus on the fact, uh, on the partnership with uh, Laurent Collin and on the name to the Blanc, but it's actually 100% 2013 vintage in stock. And only in Magnum, right? Only in Magnum and only 1500 Magnums. All Very numbers. cool. So this is something that we want to repeat. Um, we'll certainly do another series with Laurent Collin, but certainly in five to ten years, uh, with this idea of uh, in 10 years, how her work has been evaluating and how her work has been changing. So it's, it's mm -hmm. yeah, it's a very long lasting project to, mm -hmm. to see how wine is evaluating and changing and how her artistic work is also evaluating and changing. If, there, if anybody is interested in getting their hands on some of these beautiful magnums, um, I know if they're not here already, then they're probably on the water. As much you said, it's a very limited production, so we don't have very many to go around, but if you shoot us an email at info at kindredvines.com, I can see if there's still some available for you. So, definitely, and the rest is going to be a little bit more, you know, uh, all what you already know, um, we, we have recognized all over the world. I will not stay too long on that. You all are aware about, you know, um, the typical journalist. Um, if we are proud of those rights, even if it's not what we're looking for all the time. But of course, we are proud of you know the rights that we are getting from those uh, highly esteemed uh, you know person, wine person, journalists. So of course, we we just including them into our presentation usually. So from the wine bouquet, from the wine enthusiast, uh, of course, James Huffing as well. I'm sure you know James. Um, is more famous for the attention in wines, but of course, he loves champagne as well. You know, he's British. And the decanter, since we're strong in, in Great Britain as well. Um, we've been rating number one Blanc de Blanc non vintage uh, by the Fine Wine magazine um, last year. So that also, uh, and we're talking about the Blanc de Blanc non vintage, so really the one that we actually still have studied first. Also, great recognition that we have. And we have a couple of highlightings, of course. Uh, we are in partnership with the Michelin star chef Guy Martin, uh, that you may have heard about. Uh, he owns the Grand Vefou in Paris, which is a Michelin star. And this partnership was very important because uh, you may not know the story, uh, but um, I'm sure you all know that um, Napoleon Bonaparte has a wife, and her wife's uh, name was Josephine. And the favorite restaurant of Josephine de Beauharnais, which was Napoleon Bonaparte's wife, was uh, Le Grand Befour. So 
uh, way. That was is why also this partnership is very important because of you know the historical links that we have with that particular resident. And Guy Martin is a fantastic chef as well. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, um, we got lucky enough last year to be included into the World Most Admired Champagne Brands. Um, so that's something which is, let's say again, we accept all the recognition, but this is not what we're looking for. Um, as I say, we are a house, but we are a grower as well. We are right in the middle. So it's uh, fantastic to be included in those listings with such, you know, uh, fantastic other houses around us. So um, also very proud of that. Again, another one of the highlighting that we have is we within our rights. If you go to London, I mean, when you'll have a chance to travel again, you'll be able to see this fantastic uh, Joseph Bayer's uh, corner in, in our rights in the wine and spirits department. It's definitely, again, one of the strong partnerships that we have for years and which is very important. And then the usual listing, but then it's getting a, not as interesting. You, If you need uh, some recommendation of fresh ones, uh, we can definitely talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a, a kind of a small summary of uh, who we are, what we do. Um, um, the family owned affair is very important for the FPA, sixth generation. Benjamin just took over last year, so it, it's fantastic to be at the beginning of uh, another 40 years of history for the house, uh, approximately. Um, one of the original Grand Mark house, what we call in the past Grand Mark, so definitely one of the top houses. Uh, and in the meantime, for a very long, um, we stay kind of under the radar. Um, so it's definitely what we're trying to do to actually um, be over the radar <laughs> now again. Um, on the house making champagne in Chalon, of course, um, the cellars that we talk about, the vineyards, we talk about um, a great deal of the production still done by hand. That's definitely mostly due to the appellation, but also because we want it as well. Um, so you find in this list all what we do, um, all what makes Chalupet Bay is so unique and distinctive. Um, the style of the wines, the history, the family, um, the recognition we have, it, it's definitely all what we're talking about. Um, we're not better, we're not worse, we're just ourselves and that's definitely fantastic. Mm -hmm. We have another question um, from Fabrice, a, a great question asking, so what's new and what's upcoming in the next few years for Joseph Perrier? So, uh, well, a lot of things. Um, most of the new things are going to be here in Chalon because um, we have decided to start uh, last year, one year ago, a strong renovation project. Uh, we didn't really renovate anything in Chalon Champagne for, I would say, I shouldn't say it, but almost for here. And so we're going to change a lot of things. We've invested close to 2 million euros into the renovation of uh, the cellar, the house. So we're going to have a boutique, we're going to have a small museum, we're going to have a guided tour. Um, there's going to be a small place to enjoy a glass of champagne as well. Um, we are just changing everything and accelerating our wine tourism interest and focus. And definitely, this is a huge project for us. And originally, I wanted to start this um, doom uh, outside in the courtyard uh, because I thought there wouldn't be so many trucks in the courtyard. But as you can imagine, this, this was not the case. So I said I wouldn't show you the trucks. There is absolutely no point. Uh, but uh, I hope that in the next few weeks uh, we can do that again and I will start this uh, conversation outside like you can see exactly uh, with your own eyes where we are and, and, and the beauty of this fantastic building we are in. Um, just for the, the story, uh, we are situating in a 17th century Rolle de Poste originally and that's definitely, and you can ask Emily and Chuck who have been there, uh, quite a unique place uh, to come and visit. So that's definitely the big things for us. Um, the second big thing is not out yet, uh, but this is going to be uh, concerning the wine and we have a lot of projects coming in. Um, the first one is going to be the new wine that we are releasing because we are releasing mid-June a uh, new quality, uh, Brut Nature. So we've decided to actually re, um, let's say, 
um, continue that idea um, of um, showcasing the freshness, this um, balance, this uh, fruitiness of our wines. And of course, it's going through kind of, you know, a sugar reduction. And especially since um, the arrival of uh, Nathalie, our chef de gare, Kev, she's definitely one of the uh, big, let's say, a supporter, a big fan of this idea of uh, trying to reduce a bit the sugar to find the right balance between the food expression, between the minerality, between the acidity. And so the arrival, the realizing of this brut narrative is definitely something very important in you know the development of the range. This is the first time that we have a brut nature in the range and it's definitely for our being tasted wine is a beautiful one. We are releasing it mid-June and I hope if we can just potentially start to work again and all that, that it can be on the market for the end of the year. And just so you guys know, I just sent the tech sheet for the Brutnature that Matthew was talking about in the chat. So please, if you want some more information about that, go ahead and check out that attachment there. Does anyone sure. else have any more questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matthew. No, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me. I know I can be very enthusiastic and I can talk a lot. So thank you. I hope I was not too boring. Not at all. Um, and, and I really hope, because I'm going to repeat myself, you know, maybe I'm getting a little bit old, but uh, I really hope that I can just welcome you here in Champagne very soon, uh, because this is still the best way um, to show you, to make you understand exactly um, what's Champagne and what is Joseph Pay. And I would be more than happy to have you here uh, and to show you around and to share those fantastic moments uh, all together because we're missing those moments all together and, and we'll, we'll need some uh, very big one in the future to catch up a little bit what we miss. So I really hope to have you here in Champagne very soon and I hope that I can travel again as well. Later. And we'll start in the States and then we'll finish in Champagne. Uh, merci, Mathieu. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Mathieu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very Thank you. much. Thank you. Have a beautiful afternoon. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, be safe, please. And never forget to drink Champagne and to drink Joseph Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> most important. Uh -huh. Merci beaucoup. Bye-bye. Take care. Au revoir. Au revoir.